um, I started out majoring in, so I did my undergrad in biology. And when I was just finishing up my, my senior project, my advisor sat me down and was saying, okay, here's, here's what we're gonna work on, blah, blah, blah. And so then I said, well, can we, once we do that, can we do this, this, and this? And he's like, well, that's not it. That's not biology, that's biomedical engineering. It's on the north end of campus. And so I had always just thought of engineering as like circuits and wires and bridges and stuff like that. And so like, ah, it's not for me. But as soon as he said that, I kind of got the wheels working in my mind. So. I actually got a master's degree in something else, and then I uh, I liked what I was doing, but I realized that I would have I would have enjoyed being an engineer better, so I went and studied engineering. But so, anyway, it's just kind of a long pathway. But in terms of uh, like the medical stuff that I've done, um, I think that it's just really drawing on those roots that I that I built when I was in biology. So I've always enjoyed biology. I've always enjoyed just like you know environmental stuff, medical stuff. And so I think that that's just why I, that's how I've got I've gotten to where I am right now. I'm happy to talk about that one. That was actually one that uh, some of my students competed with uh, in Bench to Bedside, and they won the People's Choice Award. So I was excited about that. But anyway, um, this project was not even really one that I came up with on my own. So I did my dissertation work in hydrogel sensors, and so. Right after I did an invention disclosure with the TBC, um, as soon as I became a faculty member, uh, an NGO in Guatemala reached out to the TBC and they said that they were looking for somebody who knew how to make super absorbent polymers. And so they reached out to me and they said, hey, Jeff, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I love Guatemala. And then they said, well, don't you, want to, don't you want to know what the project is first? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. What is it? He said, feminine hygiene. And I was like, I don't care. That's fine. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, so that's how I got the project. And so it started off with they wanted to kind of reduce some of the waste management stream issues that they were having in Guatemala. They don't have like government sponsored waste management. It's just some guy, probably like, you know, some poor guy uh, straps a tarp to his head and yeah, tells people to bring out their garbage and to bring it out and they pay him and he drops it off the side of a cliff, which is where the poor people live. And this is in Guatemala City specifically. So when I've seen this firsthand um, in Guatemala City, so I thought, you know, I, I don't want to have a solution that's going to be uh, causing more problems. Like if we're all of a sudden, like if they don't have access to feminine hygiene products now, I definitely don't want them to uh, start using them and then dumping this biohazardous material over the side of the cliff. So, so I, I, I really believed in, in, the, in the idea and bought into it quite a bit. So we were working on it and they were mostly looking at the super absorbent layer that goes into feminine hygiene products. And um, I thought it was really interesting and I was actually leveraging a lot of my biology background thinking about the degradation, like the biodegradation pathways of materials and everything. And I had some students working on it in the lab and I thought like the stuff that they, were, that they were coming up with was nice because it was biodegradable, but it wasn't nice because it was petroleum based and it was degrading into um, like unstable intermediates that could cause problems with water and soil. So I thought, okay, we need to just kind of take a step back from this for a minute. So anyway, we started to try out like just plant-based materials. We didn't want to change the like the vegan part of the world or anything else like that. But the, the main focus was really just how do we provide access to feminine hygiene products for women in developing countries. And so a lot of them, like there have been a lot of projects, which I think are wonderful. Like there are these uh, printed uh, pieces of cloth, but they're, they're reusable. And so a lot of these women don't have access to, um, uh, to clean water to be able to wash them. Um, and so that, that kind of becomes a problem. And there have been other things made out of like banana fibers, but they swell up a lot. And some of them, in fact, we work with the school in Kenya and they call it the banana burrito. And so they don't think that's very comfortable. So we're trying to like, what they've all said is we want what women in the US have access to. So about a year, maybe a year and a half into the project, there was this uh, like a venture capital type of call. And we're like, oh, we might as well just see what, what we can do. But there needed to be some Utah tie. And so we started to investigate um, just like, okay, women in, the US, in Utah have access to, to pads, but what happens to them after they degrade? So we started to do this study and do a, a lit review, and we did some studies on our own in the lab, and we discovered that there were um, small molecules that were being absorbed into the body through mucous membranes, and so those had some toxicity associated with them. Um, 
And then we, were, we also just saw that, they, you know, these are single use things, you use them for six hours at most, and then they go sit in a, land, a landfill for 450 to 1,000 years. So we started to think, okay, well, how do we reinvent every single layer that goes into these? And so we've gone through every layer. We have lots of different materials that could be used, and I think that they'll end up being region specific, um, depending on where the manufacturing happens. Um, but like late, so lately, our, our biggest thing has been hot melt adhesive. So the adhesive that's used to construct the whole pad. And so that's interesting because it's, I mean, there are you know, desirable properties that are associated with the hot melt adhesive. And they make it easy for, for manufacturing a thousand pads in a minute. But if you were to use like Elmer's glue, which is biodegradable, it would take a long time to cure and you know like how the, the glue has to dry out so they use it like pretty much like hot glue gun stuff uh, to make these and so just it cures really quickly but um it does it takes a long time to degrade and the landfills we, we we've been working with uh, an adhesive manufacturer that's the world's largest adhesive manufacturer just on the development and testing of our material and it's been interesting talking to them because they said that there has not been any innovation in this space whatsoever and nobody's thinking oh how do we uh, redo all of this and so a lot of the a lot of my interest is just how, I mean, you know, so as, as a polymers guy I'm really interested in like how do I make things that are not going to have a negative impact on the environment there are so many barriers <laughs> to this whole project and so like even the manufacturing, so like what happens is we go through, and this is where I think like the whole translational science type of thing kind of comes in the most is that as R&D people, we're like, okay, what's the user experience? So, okay, great. We make these, these products, we use these materials that you know, they last for a certain amount of time, they absorb a certain amount of fluid, they degrade in a certain amount of time, like, okay, this is awesome. So then we go reach out to a manufacturer and say, okay, we have this really cool thing that we're ready to make. And they're like, okay, what's the, the tear strength? Or what, and we're like, what on earth do these things even mean? Like, we've just never heard of them. Because what's happening is they have different manufacturing parameters that they have to satisfy. They don't care at all about what the end user result is, like how does it work for them? Where does it go when they're done with it or anything like that? So like, that's where, that's actually where we are right now is like, okay, well, what is all of this stuff? So we haven't started manufacturing anywhere. Um, we do have lots of partnerships all over the place and they're all just kind of sitting there ready for us to say, okay, here's our first set of, of, of prototypes. So right now, the big holdup is the hot milk adhesive. I think everything else has pretty much been engineered to the point where it needs to be, but the, the adhesive doesn't quite have the, the manufacturing capabilities that we want. So it has the performance, the user experience, but it doesn't have the manufacturing uh, performance that they need to be able to, to, to use it because it, it starts to smoke at a certain temperature and it kind of has a weird color after it's been sitting in the heated melt for, for too long. So anyway, yeah. Tons of people in probably 20 or 25 countries that are just saying that they're so excited, they're so interested in it. So we have all these mini partnerships, we've got them in Pakistan and places I've never heard of before, like Cameroon and Timor Leste and uh, stuff like that. So like it's it's interesting that people are, are really excited about it. Um, but it's there's just there are so many hurdles that we have to pass in order to get even like a like a first prototype run on the manufacturing equipment. Like right now we can make it really easily with like looking like arts and crafts, like a third grader made it in a in an art class or something, but that's how it looks. So Yeah, I've been writing a lot of proposals lately. Uh, one of them is looking at, I'm working with a pulmonologist at the University of Utah. And uh, he has like specific biomarkers that exist in, that are prominent in patients with, uh, with COVID-19 that are markers for survivability versus non-survivability. And then the presence of those biomarkers will determine the, the treatment that the patient gets. And so, I mean, as a sensorless guy, I think, okay, well, let me help you uh, detect those things so that you can do a really quick uh, assessment of the patients and you can know how to, how to best treat them when they're in respiratory distress. So I've got 
that um, I wanted to translate because like cardboard boxes, if you think about them, like they should be compostable, totally compostable, but they're not because of the adhesives that are used. I'm like, well, if these things are done with, with feminine hygiene, it's a different hot melt adhesive. I'm like, why don't we just reinvent like just packaging materials? We could make cardboard boxes that are going to be compostable. And so, I mean, those are just two. And then like wearable sensors, because I think everybody's like, I, I mean, as an engineer, I'm curious about everything. I'm like, oh, what, what does my hydration look like? Can I put that as, as a sensor in my Fitbit? Because I wear my Fitbit religiously. And so like, I want to look at things like that. So yeah, so those are the kinds of things I've got on the horizon.